morning. Our first, um, our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah. In the few Bibles, you can find that on page 494, continue to 495. It's Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. Now we're reading that in the New International Version. The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Our psalm this morning is 31. You, verses 9 through 16. You can find that written responsibly in the bulletins. So we can read that together. Psalm 31, 9 to 16. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief. My soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors. And an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have, I have become, become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many. Terror on every side. As they scheme together against me. As they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Yes, Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Philippians. You can find that on page 790 in the Pew Bibles. It's Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, page 790. And I'll be reading that in the New American Standard Version. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our gospel reading this morning is from the gospel according to Matthew. So if you'll turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 and beginning in verse 11. You can find that on page 671 if you're following along in the Red Pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 27 Beginning in verse 11, hear now the gospel of the Lord. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Bart Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of all this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in its right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, 
come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. May God bless this reading of his holy word. And now... May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get this straight, Pastor Mo. Oh, yeah. Grab the mic. So, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Today's Palm Sunday, isn't it? You know, happy, happy, wave the palms. Pick them up, Hosanna, Hosanna! Well, yeah. But in the lectionary, there is also for those churches who don't have Holy Week services an option for what is called Passion Sunday, which is the last Sunday before Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And since historically this church has not done midweek services for Holy Week, we kind of go straight from the joy of the triumphal entry to the joy of Easter and kind of like blow right by the cross without even acknowledging it. Hello? And so what I've been doing since coming here, for those who may not remember or may not have been here, is that I'll preach a Palm Sunday sermon one year, preach a Passion Sunday sermon the next year, and now since using the lectionary, makes it even easier still, because the readings are already picked. I'm dumb, I'm not stupid. So, it is both Palm and Passion. Now, as was announced earlier, we will have the doors open on Good Friday from noon to 3. Jennifer and I will be here. Um, we were hoping to have others. Um, Dave and Lynn over at New Beginnings Church of the Nazarene, the Shaws, were going to come and take part in that as well this year. Obviously, we can't do that without potentially running afoul of the under 10 rule. So we'll postpone that for another year, but, but we will be here. The doors will be open for those who wish to pray and wish to take a little bit. They will be in half-hour increments from noon to 1230, 1230 to 1, and so forth until 3 o'clock. Again, there will be a hymn to start, a reading from one of the seven last words of Jesus, and then a time of quiet reflection, a time of quiet meditation finished off with another hymn. 
then the cycle begins anew the next half hour. So you can come and stay for a half an hour, you can come and stay for however many segments you want, you can stay for the whole three hours, anything in between. Um, you are welcome to do that. Again, though, be mindful if there are nine people here in the sanctuary, we will have the doors open to the fellowship hall, which is isolated from the sanctuary for purposes of, of the COVID-19 thing. So, you know, just slip into the, those doors will be open as well. So you can slip into those doors and still take part that way. Um, and so we now return you to our regularly scheduled sermon. The Passion of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, actually, let me let me start with the with the psalm that we read today, and in in it there is this. Lament. It's a messianic psalm. It's one that prefigures what Jesus is going to go through. Forgotten like one who is dead, become like a broken vessel, hearing the whispery of many terror on every side. They scheme together against me as they plot to take my life. Um, Jesus was not a popular guy in his time and place among a certain segment. He was very popular with some, very unpopular with others. Guess who he was unpopular with? The world or with the religious ones? The religious ones. Yeah. Um, God hates religion. Religion is a dead form. It is formulaic. It is death-giving kind of like this virus that's going around. Um, some of you have seen my famous brown t-shirt, Christianity is not a religion, it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a relationship with a living, breathing human being. Just like we have relationships one with another, even though we are separated by many, many pews. <laughs> apart from one another. I see one, two, three, four, five, five pews in between, so that's definitely the six-foot thing. You're at the end of one set of pews, you're another row behind and over at the far end, and, and, and so there's plenty of room in there. Or beds off by yourself. <laughs> but that's okay. This bed has had some issues recently, and, and, and so it's better that we all be safe. And, and again, I, I reiterate what I said before, that it's okay to not physically be here during this time or, or any other time if it will be a threat to your physical health. I would rather you not be present for a week or two or six than to come here, get sick, die, and we lose you until the resurrection, okay? Um, I want to be self, I'm selfish, okay? I want you guys around for a long, long time. All of you. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> yes, we love you too. <laughs> but Jesus didn't just come to reconcile, to, to, to save us and, and let us go to heaven. You know? It's, it's not about us in that sense not about us as individuals um, i was reading an article the other day yesterday actually about different mindsets in different cultures how in western culture in particular in the united states where we tend to be extreme in this sort of thing we're very individualistic right I mean, it's, I mean, New Hampshire, live free or, well, whatever. Oh, yeah, live free or die. Although sometimes I question it, whether we really do. But it's, it's that very individualistic, don't tell me what to do kind of thing. I can make up my own mind. That's New Hampshire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you should know, because you've been down here, what, how many generations? <laughs> 
You're, old, your family's been here longer than some of the rocks that pop up out of the soil, right? Those New Hampshire potatoes that we pick out of the lawns every year. And stubborn is the granite. But in other cultures, it's not about the individual. It's about the community. Asian cultures, Western, Eastern cultures are very, very well known for that by and large. And um, the basis of this particular story was that normally in Eastern cultures, it's putting your good and, so, and, and, and putting the, the community's good ahead of your own. So taking yours, suppressing it, and even if it's bad for you, but it's good for the community, you do it. But in the northernmost island of Japan, and I hope I'm saying this right, Hokkaido, Hokkaido. It's not right, but anyway, where Sapporo is, was actually an uninhabited wilderness for much of its history, and only in the last hundred years or so has it been populated because of the growing threat from Russia, and so the Japanese government decided to populate the northern island and put, put people there. Now, it's only 30 miles away from the rest of Japan. 30 miles. I mean, that's about what, from here to Manchester-ish? Maybe Derry? 30 miles, not very far. And yet the mindset of the people on this island, because it's so remote, it was so, well, so much wilderness for so long, is more Western and individualistic than even just in the rest of Japan. And so we, with our Western mindset, tend to forget that the Bible was not written by men and possibly in a couple of cases women who have that Western mindset as we do, that individualistic mindset. And even today in the Near East, there is this different culture, this different way of thinking that's even reflected in the Hebrew language that we just don't have here. And so when it talks about the body, when it talks about the group, and even when it talks about Jesus, it's not just that we're, we're not saved for the sake of the individual. We are saved for the sake of everybody around us. Does this make sense so far? If this does not make sense so far, I need to know, or I can't go on. I need to know that everybody understands what I'm trying to say here. That we are not saved simply so that we can be with Jesus for the rest of eternity. That's part of it. That's the starting gate. But we were saved for a purpose. Just as Jesus shed all his prerogatives, as, as Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, that he divested himself of, of, of his divinity and took on the form of a servant and suffered for the sake of those whom he served and died that we may live, that that same mind needs to be in us. Let your mind be that of Christ, putting the good of others before you. And so we see that some are wearing masks, not just for protection, but potentially because we don't know. Even though we are asymptomatic, some of us may be carrying it even now. And so others are wearing the masks right now, just in case. They are carrying, so they do not, or at least have less of the chance of infecting others, because not all of us have the N95 masks, which really should be going for the first responders and the medical teams and whatnot. But it's weird to us in our Western mindset, that individualistic, don't tell me what to do mindset. That good old swamp Yankee, I'll just do what I want, thank you very much, mindset. We're, we're a stubborn folk. The Bible has a phrase for that. It's called a stiff-necked people. 
Got to be stubborn. Got to be obstinate. It's a fancy way of putting it. So, how do we put our desires, our needs, our wants aside for the greater good of all? And we've been making changes even here to protect those whom we love. We've limited the number of people who come here just in case visitors from other churches that cannot meet in person come by, and some have, some do. We've set up provision for them in, in another room. Actually, we've set up provision for us in the other room while they come in here to the sanctuary. This morning is a communion Sunday. It is the first Sunday of the month, and so we have the elements on the table, but we also have elements prepared in the fellowship hall just in case we needed it. Instead of using the full matzah, as we normally do, I have a quarter of a matzah that I will be using. And then we have the individual pillow breads that have not been touched. The bag was clipped open and they were poured without touching into the plate, shaken a little bit so that they separated. We're changing because we love each other. We are voluntarily, mostly, when we go to the store, waiting to be let in. And for some of us of a certain generation, those of us with a little snow on the roof, whether or not we cover it up, said some of us, you're too young to remember this. You're, you're just a pup. And so, you know, it feels like the collective, right? When, when the Soviets used to go to G-U-N, GUM, or, or however they pronounced it, you'd see these long lines of people waiting, waiting to be let into the store, which wasn't really all that well stopped when, when you got down to it. Sounds a little bit like today, if you're looking for toilet paper, or paper towels, or I guess eggs is the new paper towel anymore. And so what do we do? We've been sharing what we have. And Jesus shared what he had. Now, some changes are going to be painful. And some of us may physically suffer through this time. Whether through this disease or something else. Many of our people are suffering even now because of the isolation that they are forced to endure. So how do we minister to those who are away, those who are apart? How, for example, can we get palms to those who would desire them? Because we can't just waltz right into Epson, for example, anymore and, and drop some off. Yeah. You know, in, in New Hampshire and a lot of small towns throughout the nation, it's our neighbors that we lean on, depend on, yep. and grow up with. And uh, that would be a good way to, to uh, distribute. An excellent way. We got a perfect example of that sitting there and there. The two of you usually sit together. And it's really weird seeing you way over here and you way over there. Um, you're almost as far apart now as your houses are. <laughs> okay, granted, you're only across School Street. That's beside the point. <laughs> but yeah, you come, you help. He does every, every week. Yeah. At yeah. least five days. Right. But how do we, like Jesus, lay down our lives for others? Because in laying down his life, did he die? Yes, no, maybe. Everybody says, yes. He died. He died. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. He didn't just kind of like suffer and they took him away and he revived and, and off he went into the distance went into hiding, nobody ever saw him again. 
Um, didn't work that way. He died. People knew what death was. I mean, they 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 took that cat of nine tails, that 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 whip that has a whole bunch of leather straps with rocks and bone and whatnot tied into it, and, and just basically ripped his back apart in those thirty nine lashes. I mean, the blood loss from that alone. When they put the the purple cloak on him and they ripped it off. I mean, think about this. The man is bleeding. He's got raw wounds on his back. You throw this piece of cloth on him. You start banging around him and maybe even like hitting him in the back with stuff and, 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 and making those wounds all the worse. But anybody ever tried to take a gauze off a wound like that? Say off your leg or off your arm or off your finger or something? It just, yeah, it, it hurts and it rips. And so when they rip, when they took that cloak off him, think about this, they reopened those wounds again. And they put his own clothes back on him. And then the blood started clotting against those clothes. And when they stripped him for the crucifixion, and by the way, there was no loincloth around him. They took everything off. The shame was total. Ripped it off and it opened again. And so now you've got this raw open back going against the rough wood. I mean, this cross here is nice and smooth and planed and varnished. That alone wouldn't be a bad thing. But we're talking a railroad tie here. Pretty much. Splintery. Nasty. Not to mention the nails. I mean, do you ever pinch your wrist? you got pressure points. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for the, the pressure points. They were looking for the nerves to make the most pain possible. That's why they had to invent a whole new word to describe the pain of crucifixion. It's called excruciating. From the Latin crucis, cross. And why did he do it? He did it out of love. He did it because he could not bear being apart from humanity. These beings he created in his own image. He loved us that much, that he went through that to be assured that we would be reconciled to him, knowing full well that death was not the end. Now you walk around right now, I'm watching TV, and, and the reporters were usually always smiling, right? And we'll be back right after the break. They're like, we'll be back right after the break. They're not smiling. They're trying to. You, you can see it in their eyes when they do. But they're afraid. You walk around in the stores. People are either treating it very, very lightly because they're afraid. Treating it very, very with, with great paranoia because they're afraid. Or treating it lightly because they're confident that death is temporary. Yeah. And that's you. That, I think that's everybody in this room, really. Now, is it a serious concern? Yeah. Are we not happy that this is going on? Yeah. I can only speak for myself, but yeah, I'm looking around and people are nodding. But is death the end of it? That whoever dies with the most toys wins. Yeah, I mean, this kid, the one with the most toilet paper wins. Good grief. So who needs to know that good news? Who needs that confidence that, you know what? If they get sick, and if, God forbid, they die in the body, that if they're connected with Jesus, that they are risen with him in his resurrection even before they die, that they have that promise that we have, that promise of eternal life. That's what this season is all about. 
We have this season of Lent, which is drawing to a close, this time of introspection, this time of, of fasting, of extra prayer, of, of extra giving in many cases. This particular week, starting with Palm Slash Passion Sunday and going through to Monday Thursday with the foot washing and, and the Passover meal. And, and again, the Passover starts this Wednesday at sundown. So it's really almost, it's really pretty close in timing to, to the year that Jesus died. Good Friday when the actual crucifixion took place. From noon to three in particular when the darkness covered the whole earth. The sixth hour, that would be noon in our way of thinking. The ninth hour would be three o'clock in our way of thinking. We had 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of dark, no matter how long it was day or night, they divided it up into 12, and that high noon was six, so six hours. A quarter of the way up or a quarter of the way down, then that's the sixth hour and the ninth hour. And so that's why the vigil went from 12 to three. But who needs to know the gospel? Who needs to know that Jesus is king? Who needs to know that death has been defeated by the cross? Because after Good Friday, you've got Holy Saturday, that Sabbath where Jesus rested in the grave, his work being completed, remember his last words on the cross before giving up his spirit, it is finished. Father, in your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. What was finished? The recreation. Jesus, the second Adam, did what the first Adam didn't do. And he undid everything that the first Adam did. It's even more important. And he rose from the dead. When they came that Sunday, when they came that first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, even as dawn was breaking, and the sun wasn't even really over the horizon yet, it was just getting light. And off to the grave they went, and the stone is rolled away, and the angels are there, and he ain't here, kids. His death could not hold him. Yeah, yay, indeed. But you cannot appreciate the goodness without the grief, can you? I mean, I've said this before, I'll say it again, it's a classic example. When you go to buy a diamond, they just kind of hand it to you on a, on a piece of paper and they say, take a look at it. No, they put it on this black velvet cloth. Why? Because against that black background, this black is, is not a color, according to artists. It is the absence of all color. So any light is not reflected by black. It is all absorbed by black. All the light waves are absorbed, nothing comes back, and so there is this absence of color, which we call black. You get the diamond with all these facets. It's just like this little prism when it's cut just right. And it really, really shows up well against the black. That shines most bright when against that which is most dark. There is darkness in this world, yes, no, maybe. Oh, yeah. Is that darkness increasing and getting even darker still? No question about it. But as it gets darker, what happens? You go outside right now, or you go outside on an especially sunny day, and you look in, 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 in at these windows and you say, how pretty, how nice. But if you sit especially on this side here. If you just sit there under those pines where the outhouse used to be, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. Everybody's laughing. This is not yeah. young. You're, most of you were old enough to remember that. Um, okay, it wasn't all that long ago. It was only in the 70s that so they got rid of it. Yeah, hallelujah indeed. And you just watch because we keep these lights behind me on all night. And as it gets darker, these windows get brighter. And on a moonless night, they get really bright, don't they? Why? Because it's darker. 
So as the darkness comes, we need not be afraid of it. Because we are the light of the world. Why? Jesus is the light of the world. We are united in Christ, baptized in him. We don't just reflect his light. He calls us the light. He is the light of the world, yes. But he calls us, his church, the light. How do we shine light in this darkness? That is the question. And what I want you to think about as we prepare to take the elements this morning. And so in preparation, I will close out this time with a prayer. We will sing Twilight Harris's Lamb of God, recite the Creed, and finish our services. So Father in heaven, we thank you through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Passover Lamb. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood, which has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And, and we ask, especially in this time where we, in particular, dwell in your sacrifice, that, that we consider how to, we may sacrifice what we might wish for the benefit of those others who have no hope or have lost their hope or, or who are somehow other affected in body or soul, heart and mind, spirit or will. Holy Spirit, we ask that you bring to mind ways in which we can minister to one another, ways in which we can minister to our neighbors, our communities, food pantries, homeless shelters, whatever it is, Lord God. Teach us your way. Give us your mind, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name.